Imagine this. You're at home watching TV and you want to turn it off. So what do you do? Most of us hit the remote control, leaving the TV on standby, wasting energy. Not because we want to waste energy, but because that is actually what you're supposed to do if you use a remote control correctly. We've all come across technologies that affect our energy consumption in a negative way. Let's change that together. How you may ask? More power to the people, I say. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's take a few steps back and start at the beginning. When I was an anthropology student, I spent quite a lot of time worrying whether the world would ever need someone like me. And doubt nagged me until I attended my first energy conference. This would be the first time that I would ever hear insiders from the energy sector talk about how to provide us with sustainable energy in the future. And what I heard was this. We're facing great challenges in the transition to an era of sustainable but also unreliable energy sources in the electricity grid. An era where we literally may have power as the wind blows. Quite an eye-opener to a newcomer like me. But what was actually even more eye-opening to me was the suggested solutions to this challenge. We have to stop looking at people as load points. We have to see them as energy consumers, because we need to engage them actively in changing their behavior towards a more flexible energy consumption. People will have to consume energy as the wind blows if we want a sustainable future. People as load points. Wow. This was definitely a different way of looking at people than I was used to. But to be fair, the man was saying that they were moving away from this view towards engaging the consumers actively in changing behavior. And this was definitely a field of work where my anthropological and, I must say, very non-technical skills could be of use. Because if you want to change behavior, you have to understand it first. So there I was, a newly graduate-aided anthropologist, finally setting out to save the world in the suburbs of Aarhus, the second largest city of Denmark. The specific natives that I set out to study were Peter and Anna, and the three girls. And we were sitting in their cozy kitchen when they were telling me how they saw themselves as a green family. When I asked them what being green meant, they came up with several examples like, we never drive to the nearby store, but always use the bike. We never use the dishwasher for the big stuff. And even though we do have a tumble dryer, we only ever use it for the absolutely necessary stuff. Being a family with three small children, I assumed this would be emergency drying of snowsuits and such. Fortunately, I had enough sense to ask Anna what necessities were. I always use it for towels. I just can't stand stiff and scratchy towels. I want them soft and I want them fluffy. And that's actually why we bought the tumble dryer in the first place. So, not quite the response I was expecting. But this actually made me see that my quest for understanding the Danish energy consumer was actually misguided from the beginning. Because clearly, energy consumers don't consume energy at all. We consume services. To put it quite simply, Anna wants comfort as a service. Anna uses the tumble dryer to get this comfort, and the tumble dryer uses the electricity. So I had to change my quest from understanding people as energy consumers to understanding people as a whole. Because if people don't see themselves as energy consumers, they won't respond to us if we keep approaching them as energy consumers. But Anna and Peter also made me see 
how important it is to understand people's own logic in their behavior and statements. Because even though I found myself sharing green values with Anna and Peter, they actually exercise these values quite differently from me in their daily lives. And this is because our daily behavior is shaped by many different, but often conflicting, values and knowledge. But also because our behavior is shaped by so many other factors than just knowledge and values. One factor is technology the technology that surrounds us. Maybe you've come across a sensor control tap recently. This is the perfect example of automation and technology gone right. You're in full control, and you can get as much water as you want, but you will never leave the tap running. So technology and design clearly affects our behavior, but technology isn't always the solution. In Japan, they wanted to reduce energy consumption used on air conditioning. So they started a campaign changing social norms, using the prime minister as a role model. The Cool Biz campaign urged business people to take off their suits in the office, even though this is traditionally considered quite inappropriate. But people felt that they could do this without losing social status, because they were part of this public campaign. This saved 460,000 tons of CO2. So social norms matter. But where do this, all these insights leave us? Clearly, changing behavior is complex. But just as importantly, Suggesting that changes in behavior is the solution to our challenges is actually putting the responsibility of saving the future back on your shoulders as individuals. You must change your behavior. And that simply isn't fair. As my examples have shown, your behavior is shaped by so many different factors, of which only a few are within your control. So we have to deal with all of these factors simultaneously. And these are factors like social norms, legislation, infrastructure, technology, design, values. But you're not in a position to do that on your own as an individual. I needed to get this understanding through to the energy sector. Because even though they're actually working very, very hard at the moment to understand the people out there. I still come across a lot of projects that consider people as energy consumers. And they still believe that the answer to this challenge will be providing these energy consumers with more technology, more data, and more economical incentives. And sure, economy technology, data, they're all relevant. And as is usually the case, the answer can be found somewhere in the middle. Obviously, developing the right technology where it makes sense, based on knowledge about people, has to be part of the solution. But don't hand over all your power to technology. And please be aware that technology won't save you all on its own. And this is actually where you all come back into the picture. Because you have to ask yourselves, what should your future look like? Today, I want to urge you all to take back the power and use it where you can to shape a future that suits you. If you're a private person, do like Peter and Anna and advise us, the researchers in. Be experts on your own lives in other words, help us understand you. And demand to be seen as human beings, with many different and legitimate concerns in your daily lives, not just as energy consumers. And if you're a decision or project maker, set the right team. The factors that shape our behavior do not care about disciplinary divides. So set the right cross-disciplinary team. 
Teams that are also willing to invite the public in as co-creators and not just as passive receivers of expert solutions. And if you're someone like me, stop pointing fingers at technology and get to work. If we could all commit to this, we could succeed in developing technological solutions based on knowledge about people and complex behavior. Solutions that would actually create more effect and more value for the people using them. Solutions that would affect our behavior as intended to reduce our energy consumption. But just as importantly, we could succeed in only using technology where it makes sense. Opening up to a whole different world of interventions like they did in Japan. But keep in mind that technology and interventions do not create effects. The people using technology and interventions do. So take back the power and use it where you can to shape a future that suits you. Power to the people. Thank you. Thank you.